As we continue to worship, I'm gonna ask you to read the first part of Psalm 95 out loud with me. And I want you to take note of two words, the word us and the word for, F-O-R. Let's read together, you can see it on the screens. Here we go. Oh, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And I'm gonna read the rest of the Psalm to you. And I want you to listen carefully to this warning, this warning that David writes. He says, today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. Dear Father, as we come to worship you together, as we come to continue to celebrate you, continue to know that you are speaking to us now through your word. God, we take that warning seriously that today we would not harden our hearts but our hearts would be tender toward you. And Lord, that we would say, through your Holy Spirit, we surrender today. God, you know our stories better than we know ourselves. You know those of us who are struggling today, those of us who need your healing today. God, we thank you that you're here. Lord, let me be so far out of the way, but by your Spirit, we trust you to change us. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. As we kick off this fall, I know for many of you, it's the start of a brand new school year. My prayer is that this next season of your life would be so full of peace and so full of purpose. My prayer is that you would be so confident of God's love, of his tender care of you, his knowledge of you, that you would trust him like never before. That in the greatest of times, but also in the hardest of times, that you would know that he is there and you would turn to him and that you would walk with him. And as you walk with him, as you walk in him, that you would grow. And that there would be so much fruit in your life overflowing, so much flourishing in your life. It would not only affect you, but it would affect your relationships. If you're married, it would affect your marriage. If you're a parent, it would affect your parenting. Those of you who are single, your students, it would affect your friendships that you would grow like never before. And I can tell you confidently that that is so possible. In fact, that is so real because that is God's desire for you. But you have a choice to make. It's the choice that we heard in Psalm 95. It's the choice between two paths. One, the first path, the, the verses that you read with me, it's a path of worshiping God. It's a path of trusting God with your whole heart and offering your life to him. But then the second part is a path of wondering. It's that warning I read. David, as he writes the psalm, he wanted God's people to know so clearly an important history lesson. And he said, remember, remember those people that God delivered out of slavery and slavery in Egypt for 400 years under a cruel and evil taskmaster. Their goal had just become to survive. But God does not leave his people in mere survival. God loves his children and he rescued them and he delivered them and God showed off in his deliverance miracle after miracle after miracle, culminating in seeing the Red Sea parted. A sea, can you imagine it? Parted, they walk through on dry land in the middle of the sea. And yet, after God did those amazing things, after God cared for them as they journeyed 
toward the promised land, providing food for them, providing drink for them. They continued to complain. They continued to grumble. Those two places that we read about, Massa and Meribah, they mean the place of testing and the place of quarreling, the place of complaining. The Lord lays out two paths for us today. The first path is a path path of worship, which leads to freedom and peace. But then there's that second path, that path of wondering. And for them, it meant that they missed opportunity after opportunity to experience God's goodness, God's plan, and eventually God's land. He says, which path are you going to walk on today? Because one is a path of peace and life and joy, and one is a path of death. It's a path of destruction. It's a path of emptiness. Which path are you going to walk on? Are you going to be a worshiper? Are you going to be a wanderer? And he starts off with these first seven verses and he lays out one of the clearest pictures in all the Bible of how we are to worship God. That word worship comes from the old English word worthship. You are ascribing value. When you worship, you were saying, This is what is most valuable in my life. And he lays this out in the beginning of Psalm 95. Let's look at it with a simple invitation. He says, oh, come, oh, come, the God of the universe, the God who created everything cares for us so much. He invites us intimately into a relationship. He says, oh, come. In Psalm 34, we see it said a different way, but I guess it's really clear for us. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I love the practicality of the Bible. The the, the spirit inspired David to write it with a metaphor that we can all relate to. Because the last time I checked, most of us like food at least a little bit. Most of us have a desire for good food, for great food. Now, when I was growing up, I will say I was not a very picky eater growing up. Most of the time, I ate what my parents provided for me. But there was one food that I said, you know what? I have no interest in eating. No interest in eating. But I had a buddy who kept bothering me, and he said, you need to come eat sushi with me. And I was like, dude, sushi is bait. Why would I want to eat sushi with you. And he's like, no, you got to come. You got to come. You got to come. Plus I'm going to pay for it. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. Today I will have to tell you sushi is one of my favorite foods. I love it. Why? Because I tasted it. I tasted it. Now that I've tasted it, I can say, oh, I love it. Or maybe I really love the wasabi I put on the sushi, but still I've tasted it. I've experienced it. He says, oh, come, oh, taste of the Lord and see he is good. For some of you, you're in an exciting place today because you've yet to taste of the Lord's goodness. Maybe you know about him. Maybe you've wanted to come to gather with his people, but you've never tasted of his goodness because when you taste and see that the Lord is good, when you taste and see how much he delights in you, when you taste and see and you realize he sent Jesus for you, It makes you realize, hey, anything else is a cheap substitute. We ruin our taste sometimes because we settle for junk food. There is no junk food that can compare to Jesus Christ. He is so worthy. He is so incredible. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Some of you have never yet experienced that, but maybe some of you have forgotten his goodness. Maybe you need to be reminded of his goodness because that's what happens when we worship together. The God of the universe, the God of all, the God of all creation, he's invited us in. He says, I want you to come. I want you to come into my presence. And then he he just lays out so practically for us how we are to worship him, how we are to taste and to see his goodness. We see in the... First few verses, he says, let us, let us, first of all, sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. 
Shout joyfully to him with psalms. He says, this is how you come worshiping. You first of all come worshiping with joyful participation. With joyful participation. He says, with joyful singing. Not just singing for singing's sake. He says, singing to the Lord. We direct our songs toward him. And then he says, shout joyfully to the word Lord. Don't hold anything back at all. And then he says, shout joyfully with psalms. Psalms are scripture songs, scripture songs. He says, all of this is gathered around the word. It's all the word. We sing the word. We shout the word of God as we lift our hearts, as we lift our hearts to him. And did you notice those words I asked you to observe in the beginning? He says, let us do all of these things. He's talking about the gathering of God's people. He says, this is what I want you to do. Certainly you seek the Lord on your own, but there is something so powerful that happens when we gather together at God, as God's people. Something that we need so much. That's why he commands us to do it. But as I've watched in the trend in our culture today, we have such an individualistic culture that sadly it breaks my heart. There are people who replace the gathering of God's people with a podcast. Or, hey, I'm just going to listen to some music. I'm just going to pray on my own. That is not an option in Scripture. That's not an option. We gather together because God does something in us and through us when we come together. And he's just so practical. He's so practical. He says, this is how you joyfully get God's word in you. He says, by singing. I so appreciate when science catches up with the Bible. There's so much science now about the power of music. Isn't it interesting that as people age and their memory begins to fade, sometimes people who can't even speak and have a conversation can sing. They can sing because there's a power in singing. It gets down in you. Now, there's, there's an expression called an earworm. Do you know what an earworm is? An earworm is a song that gets stuck in your head, right? That's what we say, it gets stuck in your head. And I'm not gonna give you any samples today because that's all you'll be thinking about. But you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes you'll find yourself just walking along and the song that you're singing is, is like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm singing that song. Over and over, I'm repeating to myself that something that's not true about me or about other people. Whereas when you worship the Lord, you're singing truth about him, to him, and he, through his spirit, brings that power back down in our lives. I'm so, so thankful that we're a singing church. I'm thankful that we, that we sing together, but I have to tell you, I'm always very aware that some of you are new and it's hard for you to enter into the singing because that was my story for so long. See, I started to go to church when I was in middle school because it was my, something my parents said we had to do. And we did go every Sunday, and it was a very dutiful deal. It was what our family did. And I thought, okay, good families, we go to church on Sunday. I wasn't experiencing the power of God's love, but I was there. I was present. But then I came to know Jesus as an 18-year-old, and I realized that worship is not something you go to. Hey, I went to worship today. It's not something you go to. Then I realized worship is not something you just watch. Hey, man, those, music, those musicians, singers are so talented. No, worship is something we do. And for many years, I was the guy that during the music time, I would just stand with my arms crossed and I was just like, you know, I don't sing. I have a terrible voice. I, I'm embarrassed about the way I sing. And, and I was like this. But the beauty of singing together, when we come together, we do make a joyful noise to the Lord. We do make a joyful noise and we need each other. In Colossians, Paul tells this church, he says, sing songs of praise to one another. You know why? Because there are times, hear me say this. There are times when people will come into a community gathering, a time of worship that we have, and their lives are so beat up, their lives are so broken, they are just glad that they are here, that they're here. And they need you to sing for them. They need you to sing God's truth on their behalf. 
so they can hear it and they can believe it and they can trust it. There's some times that we just feel like we can't sing, but coming together with God's people and we celebrate him together and suddenly something begins to happen. Something is stirred within us. Jesus was having a conversation with a woman and she came, she thought she was just looking for water to satisfy her thirst. And Jesus said, you have a deeper thirst than you know of, but I am living water. And when you know me as living water, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. Something happens to us when we participate. I am asking you, I am praying for you, and I'm begging you, enter in. Enter in. If you've got your arms crossed, just open them up to the Lord and say, Lord, I wanna wanna get your truth down deep inside of me. That's what happens when we participate. And as you set your schedule for this fall, I'm thrilled seeing all of you here just say, nothing is more important than being in God's house. Nothing is more important than being in God's house because he does something in us and through us. We come with joyful participation. And then that next phrase, he says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. This is such a powerful picture. Have you ever parents, mom or dad, have you ever been like maybe hanging out at a pool with your son or your daughter? Let's make them little, like three years old. And they're just splashing around. They're doing their thing. And you're marginally distracted. I mean, you're aware for their safety, but maybe you got your phone out. Maybe you're trying to multitask. What are they going to do? Mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, watch me, watch me. And everything that they do is so exciting to them. And you're like going, okay, that's the 10th time I've seen you put your face in the water, okay. But they just wanna show you. They just wanna show you. They wanna show you, jump in, whatever. And if you're distracted sooner or later, what are they gonna do? Our precious children, they're gonna walk up to you and they're just gonna grab your face and they're gonna go, look at me. (laughs) Just look at me. Because they just want your undivided attention. We are commanded to come before his presence with thanksgiving. Do you know what his presence means? His face. Presence is the Hebrew word for face. Come before his face with thanksgiving. Our God loves us so much that he gives us his undivided attention through Jesus Christ. His face, his presence is with us His presence is a gift to us. When you have come together, he says, let us come before him, his presence, his face with thanksgiving. We're so thankful. And what does that tell us? That we are to come worshiping with grateful anticipation. With grateful anticipation that we come before his face, anticipating something's gonna happen. When you walked in today, when you walk into worship a worship time, a gathering with God's people, do you come in anticipating God's gonna do something in your life? Do you come in anticipating that he's going to move in your life? Because that's his desire. And thankfully, he does it through the power of his spirit. We're not limited to our worship leaders. If that was the case, we would be in trouble. That's why I pray all the time, Lord, let me get out of the way because I trust God to work. And what does he do? We can't anticipate For some of us, we're gonna learn something that we've never learned before about God. We're gonna learn something about his goodness, his power that we've never learned before. But you know what happens in worship for many of us? We're gonna be reminded of how good he is because we all have amnesia. We all have amnesia when it comes to the goodness of God. So many times in our lives, we have the pattern of trusting ourselves Trusting ourselves until we get in trouble. Trusting our own desires until we get in the ditch. And then we come and we realize, I can't do this anymore. We cry out to God for help. God helps, God puts us back on the path, his path, the path of worshiping, not the path of wondering. But as time goes by, the stress of life, it's just so easy to forget, isn't it? As we gather together, let us come before his presence, his face, being thankful to him, and anticipating God's gonna do that. For some of you, he's going to bring healing. 
You may have an emotional struggle in your life. You may be holding on to fear and he's gonna give you the supernatural peace that passes understanding. For some of you, God is gonna give you clarity and direction about a relationship, about a job. I was thinking all the times in my life that God spoke to me, moved me, healed me, challenged me in a corporate gathering, not just when I was by myself. Certainly that happens when we're by ourselves. But in this specific instance, he's saying this is something we do together. Let us come with grateful anticipation. Listen to this, what James K. Smith says. It's really profound. He says, worship works from the top down. In worship, we don't just come to show God our devotion and give him our praise. We are called to worship because in this encounter, God remakes and molds us top down. Worship is the arena in which God recalibrates our hearts, reforms our desires, and rehabituates our loves. Worship isn't just something we do. It is where God does something to us. Worship is the heart of discipleship because it is, it, because it is the gymnasium in which God retrains our hearts. Come with grateful anticipation because the Lord is at work. He's doing something. And then... We read in verse six, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. We come worshiping with humble adoration. Let us kneel. When he uses the word worship means there, he says, let us fall on our face. Let us bow down. What is this posture? What happens when we kneel? What is it a posture of? Surrender. God, I surrender to you. When you are in this position, you have very little of your own strength. You can't protect yourself in this position, but you say, God, I know you're going to protect me because God is so good. He wants us to worship him with a surrendered heart, a humble heart. It's not just that we come to him to celebrate him and to celebrate his presence in our lives, but we come to confess and we come to repent and we come to admit that we are wrong and that we need him so desperately. He says, this is the path of worship and it becomes a life and it becomes a joyful habit. And you just say, I've gotta be with God's people because that's where healing is. That's where hope is. He lays out so clearly and so practically these two paths. He says, this is how you worship. But then he, in the midst of the practicality, he says, don't miss why we worship. Don't miss why we are worshiping this great God. Verse three says it this way. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Why do we worship? Because God is our great king. When we come together, you need to be reminded, I need to be reminded how great God is. John said, greater is he, Jesus Christ, that is in you, if you're a Christian, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, our enemy, Satan, the accuser. Do you know what that means? Our great God, greater is he that is in you than any relational difficulty you may be going through right now. Greater is he that is in you, Jesus Christ, than any job difficulty you may be going through right now. Greater is he, Jesus Christ, in you than any confusion you may be going through right now. Greater is he, Jesus Christ, who is in you than any situation that looks impossible to you. Greater is he, Jesus, that is in you than any small problem or any small decision you have to make. There is nothing that can stand in his way. There is nothing that can overcome him. He has resurrection power. He stepped out of the grave. Sometimes our circumstances don't change, but we need to know, we need to be confident of the one that's holding us in our circumstances. That's what happens. Why do we worship? Because he's our great God and King. Also, why do we worship? It says the mountains are his, the seas are his. It says he made it all. We worship him because he is our creator. God is our great creator. And I love that. God does not choose favorites between mountain people and beach people, all right? He says, when you think of the mountains, when you look on the mountains, no, I made them. 
He says, when you look on the sea, know that I made the sea. If our creator God can create us, this world, stars beyond stars, the complexity of life, if he can do all that and he cares for you deeply enough to send his son, don't you think our creator can handle what's going on in your life? And then he says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We worship him. Why? Because he is our shepherd. And I so appreciate this picture He says, God, our father through Jesus Christ is our shepherd. And why did he pick the picture of a shepherd? Because when a shepherd has to deal with sheep, a shepherd has challenges. Now, I know that many of you have seen this, but I cannot think about a sheep without seeing this video. I think many of us would say that is the autobiography of our lives. We have a great shepherd. He is so worthy of worship because all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, have gone gone their own way. But the Lord has caused the sin of all of us to fall on his son, Jesus Christ. That's how much our shepherd loves us. That's how much he loves us. Listen to Jesus talking about himself in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they will follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. To sheep who wind back up in the ditch again, he continues to love us. He says he's the good shepherd. He's so good that he laid down his life for us. But also this, he says, my sheep hear my voice. We can know him. We can know that he loves us because he speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word, through his spirit, through other believers, through the community that's gathered together. He's speaking to us. And he says, I know them. He knows you by name. He knows you by need. He knows everything about you. And he says, I will give eternal life. Our shepherd gives us as dumb sheep forever life. We don't earn it. It's a grace gift from him. And we will never perish. We have forever life in him. And then that last phrase, and no one, and no one, and nothing will ever snatch, will ever pull away, will ever take us out of his hands. He has you forever. And here's the beauty, my brothers and my sisters. As you worship him, as you begin to taste and see that the Lord is good, as you continue to taste and see that the Lord is good, you begin to see the emptiness of that ditch. You begin to see that there is no payoff in that ditch. And yes, sometimes we do wind back up there again, but many times as we continue to worship him, the person we used to be is not the person we are because he is changing us. And as we start this new fall, this new season, this new year, my prayer for you is that you will take the path of life. Will you be, will I be someone who worships or someone who wonders. His grace is amazing. There's only one path that works and it's his.